All right, take three, four, I don't know where we're at. Either way, music and dance is the next section here. Um, just a few more short sections quick. Trust me, I'm not reading you all 99 pages of the background. If you want me to though, um, you can put some requests under the comment section and maybe I'll add more. No, all right, music and dance. Pra play acting took its place alongside other forms of public expression and entertainment as well. Perhaps the most important from the perspective of the theater were music and dance, since these were directly and repeatedly incorporated into plays. Many plays, comedies, and tragedies alike include occasions that call upon the characters, characters to dance. Hence, Beatrice and Benedict join the other masked guests at the dance in Much Ado About Nothing. In Twelfth Night, the befuddled Sir Andrew, on the instigation of the drunken Sir Toby Belch, nice name, good job, Shakespeare, displays his skill, such as it is, in capering. Romeo and Juliet first see each other at the Capulet Ball. The witches dance in a ring around the hideous cauldron and perform an antic round to cheer Macbeth's spirits. And in one of Shakespeare's strangest and most wonderful scenes, the drunken Antony and Antony and Cleopatra joins hands with Caesar and Abaris Pomp and Pompey and others to dance the Egyptian Bacchanals. Moreover, virtually all plays in the period, including Shakespeare's, apparently ended with a dance. Brushing off the theatrical gore and changing their expressions from woe to pleasure, the actors in plays like Hamlet and King Lear would presumably have received the audience's applause and then bid for a second round of applause by performing a stately pavane or a lively jig. Indeed, jigs, with their comical leaping dance steps, often accompanied by scurrilous ballads, became so popular that they drew not only large crowds but also official disapproval. Like shoulders and swoop. A court order of 1612 complained about the cut purses and other lewd and ill-disposed persons who flocked to the theater at the end of every play to be entertained by lewd jigs, songs, and dances. The players were warned to suppress these disreputable entertainments on pain of imprisonment. The displays of dancing on stage clearly reflected a widespread popular interest in dancing outside the walls of the playhouse as well. Renaissance intellectuals conjured up visions of the universe as a great cosmic dance. Poets figured relations between men and women in terms of popular dance steps. Stern moralists denounced dancing as an incitement to filthy lewdness. And perhaps as significant, men of all classes evidently spent a great deal of time worrying about how shapely their legs looked in tights and how gracefully they could leap. Practice your leaping while you're on quarantine. Shakespeare assumes that his audience would be quite familiar with a variety of dances. For hear me, hero, Beatrice calls her, tells her friend, wooing, wedding, and repenting is a Scottish, uh, re repenting is a, is a Scottish jig, a measure, and a syncopace. Her speech dwells on the comparison a bit, teasing out its implications, but it still does not make much sense if you do not already know something about the dances and perhaps occasionally venture to perform them yourself. Closely linked to dancing, even more essential to the stage of, was music, both instrumental and vocal. In the early 16th the re, uh, century, the Reformation had been disastrous for sacred music. Many church organs were destroyed. Choir schools were, choir schools were closed. The glorious polyphonal uh, liturgies sung in the mystery, monasteries were suppressed. By the latter part of the century, new perspectives were reinvigorated. Well, were reinvigorated in English music. Latin masses were reset in English, and tunes were written for newly translated metrical psalms. More important for the theater, styles of secular music were developed that emphasized music's link to humanist eloquence, its ability to heighten and to rival rhetorically powerful texts. This link is particularly evident in the vocal music at which Elizabethan composers excelled. Renowned composers William Byrd, Thomas Morley, and John Dowland, and others wrote a rich profusion of madrigals, part songs for two or eight voices unaccompanied, and airs, slow, songs for solo voice, generally accompanied by the lute. These works, along with hymns, popular ballads, rounds, catches, and other forms of songs, enjoyed immense popularity, not only in the royal court, where musical skill was regarded as an important accomplishment, but in aristocratic households, where professional musicians were employed as entertainers but also in less exalted circles. In his plain and easy introduction to practical music, 1597, Morley tells the story of social humiliation at a failure performed that suggests that a well-educated Elizabethan was expected to be able to sing at sight. 
even if this is an exaggeration in the interest of book sales, there's, an evident, there's evidence of impressively widespread musical literacy reflected in its splendid array of music for the lute, viol, recorder, harp, and virginal, as well as the marvelous vocal music. Whether it is the artistic Orsino luxuriating in the dying fall of an exquisite melody, or Bowie Bottom craving the songs and the bones. Shakespeare's characters frequently call for music. They also repeatedly give voice to the age's conviction that there was a deep relation between musical harmony and the harmonies of the well-ordered individual and state, the man that hath no music in himself, warns Lorenzo in the work of the Venice, nor is not moved with concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treason, stratagems, and spoils. This conviction in turn reflects a still deeper link between musical harmony and the divinely created harmony of the cosmos. When Ulysses in Trollius and Crusaders wishes to convey the image of universal chaos, he speaks of the untuning of a string. The playing companies must have regularly employed trained musicians and many actors, like the actor who is playing Pandarus in Trollius and Crusaders, is supposed to accompany himself on the lute, must have possessed musical skill. Unfortunately, we possess the original settings for very few of Shakespeare's songs, possibly because many of them have been set to popular tunes at the time that everyone knew and no one bothered to write down.